Uh, welcome to this talk, which is called uh, the state of package management in C++. Um, who knows or cares about package management in this room? Okay, so that's great, because I was afraid that nobody would raise his hand. Okay, that's cool. Uh, over the past next hour, we're going to try to discuss all of it. Uh, but I heard somewhere that it's great to stop with the code from someone smarter than you. So um, two years ago, at uh, CPCon 2017, first keynote, I think, uh, usually that's the usual keynote when Bjarne himself go on stage and talks about the future of C++, the direction it's going to take, and the new challenges it's gonna, we're going to face. And one of the things that uh, really spoke to me at the time, he said, we need a better package uh, and build system. Uh, he said that two years ago uh, in front of basically a whole audience of large audience of the C++ community. And it always feels like a statement when Bjarne goes on stage and say, we need this. So what he says, uh, actually, pitch the workflow. He says, if you want to install something, use something. You should just be able to say, OK, I'm going to download like GUI something, because I want a GUI library. Then I'm going to type install something. Uh, and then that's done. I can just open my ID. And since module are in the standard, I can just write import. Yeah, it was 2017, and we still thought that modules would be uh, like soon. But uh, maybe. Yeah, but you can just pound include if you're old style like me. Uh, anyway, that's what he pitched two years ago when he said we should do something about it. So now it's 2019. What do we have? That's the question I'm going to try to ask today in this talk. And what are the challenges we still face? Hello, I think I've done this already, right? OK, uh, the name is Mathieu. As you can see from my name and my accent, I am not Swedish. Um, I work at Paradox, blah, blah, blah. And I have a blog on which I talk mostly about build and package management, but try not to. So far, it's not been working. Uh, also, I used to be a uh, small uh, warning. I used to be a contributor for Conan when it started. So I'm trying to get rid of my bias. And as you will see in the talk, I'm not always favorable. But just so you know, being perfectly honest. So um, this talk is about what is package management, but also why package management. Because like, sure, you can take my word, or you can even take Bjarne's word uh, for why we actually need this. But maybe we should take some time to discuss why we need it. Uh, then we're going to look, of course, at what solutions we have today. What are the big packages you can find, download, install? I mentioned at least one. There are others. What can we do with it? Um, then I'm going to give you some tips. Uh, how to help package management, how to make sure that if you make a library today, it's going to be easy to package. And finally, we're going to look at the future. What, is, uh, what are the challenges to come? What are the great stuff we can expect uh, to, 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 to go even further? So let's start with something, uh, a simple question. Why package management? So I think, basically speaking, it's about getting stuff done. Uh, Let's say today you start with a project. You install like Visual Studio, GCC, Clang, whatever. And you start doing a project saying, hey, I'm going to do C++. That's going to be great. And then you look at what you can do with the standard library and basically the C++ language itself alone, standalone, like just install and run. So you can do file.io. That's great. You can open files. You can read files. You can close files. You can write files. Uh, since C++ 17, you can even like look up directories, find new files, move files, delete files, make symlinks, crazy. Uh, you can do console I.O., that's great stuff. You can like, write, uh, usually like ASCII text-based stuff. Um, if you're crazy, you can try to write uh, like extended characters, but usually basically console I.O., like the, the good old VT100. Uh, you can read the command line arguments through a great uh, array of pointers. Uh, and uh, an int, very C++ modern. Uh, you can uh, you get environment variable with get env, and you can set them. Uh, no, you can't set them. It's not standard. You can only get them. The set is not standard, from what I remember. Uh, and that's it. So that's great, but I think it's kind of limited because we try to make applications like in 2019. So we might want you know access the web. Because the web is a thing. Um, or, or, I mean, any ne network resource at all, actually. Like, OK, a socket, like TCP IP, like cutting edge. Um, let's be crazy right there, OK? Let's make a GUI, like something that's not console. Or play some sounds, or store data. Because, I mean, computing stuff is interesting, but maybe sometime you need to store data. 
And even if you can actually save and load file, it would be nice if you didn't have to rewrite your own zip algorithm every time. Just saying. Oh, let, don't get me started with Unicode. We actually have a study group for that. So, yeah, the problem is not every program in the world is about computation, pure CPU computation, threads, and then outputting the results on the consoles. We, we have programs that do more than that. You can just check what Paradox is doing, for example. Um, it's kind of hard to kickstart C++ development these days because you want to start to be, hey, I'm going to make an application that's going to be great. And then you realize that uh, you're very quickly stuck. You need, you need to use other stuff. And it's especially harmful to education because when someone starts programming and he discovers like, hey, let's, 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 let's show some language. Hey, let's try to do a project for, for like, I don't know about you, but my school, for example, was a lot about hey, take, take two months and make a project of your own, whatever you want, as a, as a small team of people. You know, have fun, try to write something interesting. And so has all kids like, oh yeah, we're gonna do a video game. And, and then they, they see what they can do with the C++ standard, and they're like, oh, maybe we'll do it in Java? <laughs> so, yeah, um, you have two solutions to that. Uh, the first one is to simply push everything in the standard. Let's have the standard do uh, network, 2D graphics. Uh, database is Unicode. We actually have some study group. We have some papers about it. I'm not so sure about 2D graphics, but the other ones will probably get there. Or, of course, the obvious that I've been avoiding for like the last past five minutes, it's use a third-party library. I mean, we don't lack good C++ third-party libraries. Uh, Boost has been there forever, and it's a great source of inspiration. Like, half the new STL features have basically taken almost verbatim from Boost, or at least from the lessons learned from Boost. Uh, if, if you, you want to make, make tests, dtest, catch are pretty good. Oh yeah, did I mention the fact that you can't do unit test out of the box with C++? <coughs> I mean, you can write your own test harness, but you can't literally do unit tests. I think for education it's kind of bad that you can't show people a new language and have them do unit tests just with installing Visual Studio. Uh, video with FFmpeg, free image, you name it. You, you probably know all those libraries. Most projects will use at least one. Um, and here is the thing, that, that's something that's really, basically like what kick-started me doing this talk and talking about package management is that I was sitting there at a conference and someone said, hey, here is my new cool library. I, I won't tell which conference because it happens at every conference. And he's like, yeah, it's great because it's header only and it has no dependencies. What? I mean, you're trying to pitch me a library so a dependency and the first thing you say, it's, it's great that you have no dependency. So wh what is the problem here? Like, why are we doing this? I, I thought about this and I thought, found two reasons. Um, the first is like, we don't trust the code that others have written, but implicitly we ask them to trust the one we wrote. The second one is that we are afraid of package management and the fact that if people have to, uh, have to deal with it, they're just not gonna use our stuff. I think the first one would make a great talk but that's not the subject today. So for the rest, we are going to stick with the second one. So basically, historically, it's going to be a, it's, it has been a problem because there had been no package management solution in C++ uh, at the start. Uh, we even inherited a lot of baggage from C, uh, some that we would like to get rid of, but not really can. Uh, and every time you have dependencies of dependencies, it's a whole rabbit hole in which most of the time you don't want to go. Uh, and then it comes the question, if I have uh, used a lot of dependencies and they have their own dependencies, how do I distribute everything at the end uh, to my actual users? Uh, well, some people have found a, a solution, just use static libraries everywhere. Like, why not? I mean, I've, I've heard people recommending me to just look static link everything, including the SDD C++ standard library. That's an option. Uh, we'll see. So the idea of package management is basically simply leverage on code written by others. That, 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 that's something we, we, we are told very young when we start uh, doing, uh, we're doing, doing program. Like don't, don't reinvent the wheel. Uh, no, the idea is that regardless of the platform of the environment, because C++ is supposed to be multi-platform and multi-CPUs and all that stuff, and at quite a low cost, uh, which is maybe not the case today, just use the code from others. Because if the cost is high, people are just gonna say, you know what, it's cheaper for me to rewrite everything than to actually use somebody, uh, something somebody else wrote. And that's, that's, I think, one of the big points of package management, is like lower the cost of actually using something somebody else done so that you don't have to rewrite it yourself because you think in the end you're gonna save money. 
And of course, yeah, don't reinvent the wheel. Like, I don't know how many of you have rewritten something that is available in a very public library. I see some people nodding. Uh, I'm not the only one. Okay, so it's not a new topic. Uh, if you ask anyone who has ever maintained or tried to uh, contribute something for a Linux distribution in his life, or a Unix distribution even, like, the idea of package management is there. If you look at apt, if you look at uh, emerge, if you look at uh, ports uh, on BSD, if you look at brew, if you look, whatever, they, they all have package management and they use binaries, like they use, they, they use uh, native code. Um, and don't even get me started on other languages, like, Someone at some, point, at some point is going to mention Rust and the fact that it has cargo and that Python has pip, blah, 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 blah. Yeah, so why are we not doing this already? I think it comes down to two reasons. Uh, the first one is that uh, we have harder problems than a lot of languages. Uh, like a lot of languages don't have ABI problems, they don't have binary compatibility issues. Uh, and also, they ship with one compiler that is basically the language itself. They have one compiler, one interpreter, one runtime that is the same. C++ is not the case. We have 30 years of Visual Studio somewhere, 20 something, 25 somewhere from GCC, 15 from Clang maybe. Uh, and if you ever tried to, you, to, to look at this, you know that it's like they have their own uh, way of being invoked, their own way of doing stuff. We, we, come from a, we come a long way of uh, historical divergences, and that, that, that's costing problem that you can just uh, wipe uh, easily. Uh, and of course, we're packaging, or we want to use software that sometimes has been there for like 20, 30 years. I don't know how old OpenSSL is, or, uh, or a bunch of other libraries we use today. They're not young. Uh, and we can't just say, okay, you know what? I have a solution for package management. If you all rewrite your build, you can use my new system. Rust can do that. New languages can do that because they, have, they start from nothing, so they can define everything. If today the, the standard committee would come up and say, hey, this is how you build C++ project now, like, that's never going to pass the vote. Like, people are going to be like, no, I'm not going to change my entire code base. That, that's not going to happen. So we have to work with the existing ecosystem, and that's, I think, mainly the reason why we had so many problems uh, historically with package management. Uh, also, we have different use cases. Usually when you say package management, you can find of, I think, think of two different use cases. Uh, the first one is what I call open environment. You're basically using open source software, or you're writing open source software, or you, you're in education. Uh, you have a bunch of students, they all have a different laptop, and they have to try uh, to, to make a project, or just discovering your language. There is no standard set of configuration. There is like as many configurations as there is clients. You can't really rely on anything except very bare bones platform dependent uh, standards and a bunch of other things. Uh, you can't even say like, okay, it's fine, Everything, everybody's gonna use Clang 4. Like, that, that's not gonna happen. You're gonna have to have handle Clang 4, but also Clang 3, Clang 5, Clang 6, and also all the version of GCC and Visual Studio and don't get, even get me started on other compilers. On the other hand, you have closed environments, which usually are more like corporate projects, uh, or even may maybe personal and private project. But it's stuff you're never going to redistribute. So all you care about is that on my machine it works. Or, uh, at the, or maybe on my build servers in the company it works. It's a much more restricted set of, uh, of potential uh, tool chains and all that stuff. And it makes the job much easier. And as, we will, as you will see, depending on your case and depending on what you need, the, the answer of which package manager you should use or how package management works for you is different. Right, so I talk, I talk about problems and how we solve them, but we actually solved a lot of those. Uh, we, we, we have a lot of solutions today. Uh, I mean, if you look at it, package management and the idea of how do you install a package has been there forever. Uh, if you look at what eMerge does, at what any port system in, uh, in, in Linux does, it's basically the same RISC-IP. So you have a RISC-IP that tells you which dependencies you should install. So first you need to install them, uh, like if you want to build project something, you need to first do install whatever it is, so well, it's recursive from the start. Uh, then you download the sources, uh, I'm talking about open source of course. Uh, possibly you apply some patch, because sometimes there are specificities in your platform or whatever that are not exactly entirely covered by the uh, by the, uh, by the project itself. And this is where the standardization comes. If the thing is standard enough, you 
don't need to patch, but most of the time you do. Uh, then you run configure, or you configure the project, you build it, and then you put all the artifacts that have, that have been generated in some install directory, the good old make install. <coughs> Like if you look any like if you look how uh, people create like .dot uh, uh, dev files or RPMs or whatever that that's basically what they do. They have a bunch of scripts written in different languages depending on that. Just basically do that for every package you try to uh, to ship or, or build. If it's a binary thing, it's even easier. Usually you install dependencies, but most binary project tends to not have too many because it it has other other issues. Uh, then you download the binaries and then you just put them somewhere as an install directory or uh, whatever, make install. That's about it. That's easy. So, how do you use that? Once, let's, let's say you have everything there. You, you can do that for every, every library in the world. How do you use it? Well, it depends on your build system and that's another problem. Uh, how do I feed uh, the fact that those packages have been built by somebody else and then I can use them? It even comes up as the first step here, like, I'm sorry, here. I install the dependencies and then I use them because basically there are dependencies to my package. How do I solve that? And it depends on your build system because no two build systems have a standard way of doing it. CMake, which is kind of the de facto standard these days when you build C++ project, has a way that is usually straightforward. I'm going to say usually, it's not 100% right, but usually for at least well-known or big project, it has a very uh, easy way. I just tell CMake where, where it has to look, run find package, you're done. If you have another build system, well, your package manager will have to find a way to talk to him and tell him, this is where your dependencies are supposed to be. This is how you're supposed to use them. And if you're really desperate, you can just say, hey, this is your include path, this is your lib path, figure it out you usually don't want to go there because it kind of solves your issue, but rapidly you will have platform problems. And if you look at that, there has been a surprisingly large number of attempts at uh, actually solving the problem of package management in C++. A lot of people have tried, a lot of projects have tried. It's, uh, again, not a new topic. Uh, a lot of different approaches uh, have been uh, tried, which is good. I think we can get a lot of good experience from that and see what works and what doesn't or what what is probably a better way. Uh, but in the end, I think only a handful will actually stand out. I had to filter that for a talk and then condense that in a list that I can actually show uh, in a one hour and something talk. So basically, I came up with a bunch of criteria uh, to select which one I wanted or more exactly to eliminate the one that didn't fit. Um, so the first one I had was it has to support the three major OSs, Linux, uh, Mac OS, OS X, uh, uh, and Windows. That's, for me, that's the basics. I, I will not put in this talk something that doesn't support all three because I think it's what every people expect to use. Maybe not uh, all the three in, in their own project, but if I take everyone in this room, I can probably find a user for each of those, which means every package should work with every of those. Uh, so out of the box, it eliminates Nougat, which was basically made for Visual Studio. Uh, and also everything that has been done specifically for Linux. So apt-get, yum, and nix, which is trying to be generic, but only for Unixes. Um, second thing you have to do is that you have to work with the existing ecosystem. A lot of very good research has been done in creating a whole new build environment in which everything is fine, and it solves a lot of issues. But when it comes to packaging stuff that already exists, it's usually terrible. Uh, because, as I said before, you cannot expect maintainers to switch to a new build system, especially since there is not only one uh, build uh, package manager that I've suggested that. There is a couple of them. So what can people do? Once they go for one, they're stuck and they're locked out of the other. What if it was the wrong choice? It's like waiting for, a sh for, 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 like, I mean, most of them would just wait until there is one clear winner and say, okay, this is the one we go for. Like, no one wants to be the guy who invested in HDDVD or uh, Betamax if you're older. Uh, so basically, that's why I would eliminate Bazel and Build2. Uh, they have very good approaches at solving the issues. If you can afford to rewrite everything you have, uh, including the build files themselves, I'm not taking about package management, but really the build files themselves, CMake, Autoconf, whatever, in Bazel or Build2. I think Bazel is trying to be able to integrate stuff that is not made in Bazel, but from what I heard from people doing package management, yes? Uh, 
probably. Um, you can, we can even talk about after because that, that I'm interested in that and see if I need to move it in another category. Can you repeat the question please? Yeah, sorry. Uh, the question was uh, Nugget is actually uh, working now on a multiple platform but there are other reasons why it wouldn't make the cut anyway. So I'm interested in, uh, in yeah, those reasons. Yeah, it's just When you want to set the .NET, it's just messy. Yeah, um, the, the remark was it's mostly uh, it's work with .NET and that comes with other problems. Uh, construct number three, uh, you have to respect encapsulation. Uh, and that's something that a lot of, uh, not a lot, but some of them uh, actually fail at, uh, which is don't be intrusive and force package management intrusive inside the build file. Don't ask people to open their CMake file and put some specific intrusives for your package manager inside. Because then again, they have to make a choice. Am I going with the right one? If you write something specific to one package manager in your build system, then it immediately is excluded for any other package manager. And so far, there is more than one, so which means we haven't decided which one is the winner yet. So don't ask people to uh, to lock in right now. Uh, it also usually breaks to the next one. Uh, the big one that is limited by that is Hunter, which basically asks you to uh, call some CMake uh, functions inside your build script that just downloads over CMake file and install them for you. And the reason it's a problem is that you have to handle the diamond problem. The diamond problem is you have a project that requires two different libraries, and both of those libraries require the same one, but possibly not the same version, or not with the same options. How do you handle that? It's a nightmare in terms of ABI and other fun stuff. If you're lucky, it's a link error that it's barely readable. If you're unlucky, it's undefined behavior in production because the signatures don't mask and the linker didn't catch that. Uh, at least, at the very least, it sh the package manager should be able to detect it and tell you, I cannot build this, I need you need to resolve that. You can go further and say, can you forbid that by construction? It's also an option, but you need at least one of them. If you cannot handle the diamond pattern, you have a problem. And that's why, usually, when you don't respect encapsulation, you can't do that. Because if a package manager cannot tell from the outside that your build system is going to fetch other libraries and use them, then it cannot detect that there is a diamond violation. And then you have a problem. And the fifth one is actually extremely uh, arbitrary. It has to be known. I cannot put you in this talk if I never heard about you. I'm sorry. And if you have something that I not mentioned and that would not uh, be eliminated by the previous criteria, come talk to me. I'm interested. But I had to work with what I knew. So basically, uh, after some careful investigation, that leaves three uh, that all respect to uh, those things. Uh, Common, VC package, and CGET. I will eliminate CGET right now for this talk because it's close from what VCPKG does in terms of approach and philosophy, but VCPKG is just has better funding and, uh, and investment, so it's just doing the same thing but more. So let's start with Common. Uh, the oldest one of the two. Uh, it appeared somewhere, it started in 2015. Uh, the big reveal was CPPCon 2016, I think, uh, when it was shown as a bunch of conferences. Uh, it's been bought by JeffRock since, uh, which has uh, gave them a, 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 a certain sense of stability and, uh, and security. It's written in Python, everything is Python. Uh, the package manager is in Python, the, uh, the recipes are written in Python, everything is Python. You have to install Python to have it to run. Uh, it has about 300 packages. I'm talking about good, curated, and tested packages. Yes? Just to the why are you writing C++ package manager Python? It's very ironic. It's an interesting question. Um, I, can, I mean, I would not like to answer for Diego, uh, the, 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 the guy who made it, but I think one of the reasons uh, is that it's a scripting, a scripting language that is basically available just about everywhere and does a lot of stuff that before C++17 you can't do. Like if you work a package manager, for example, you will need to do file I.O. and file system uh, operations, right? Before C++17 you cannot even do that out of the box in C++. Network. What? Network. What is that? Network. What is that? Networking. No, no you, can't, you can't do networking either, yes. So. I mean, you could do some stuff. I mean, some people have suggested that anything that is not written in C++ is not a good C++ package manager. Uh, to me, it has two problems. Uh, one, how do you build yourself uh, when you don't have a package manager and how do you download your own dependencies? 
uh, it's like kind of a chicken and egg problem. You can try to offer binaries that should work on most platforms, but it's still kind of an issue. And yeah, the second one is dependencies. Like again, networking, file system uh, operations. There's a lot of stuff you cannot do uh, easily in C++. Also, I'm not sure, I mean, it, I've studied the question. It's an interesting question, but do you really want to write build recipes in C++ that you have to compile? And then you can run it to actually build your project. That's an interesting question. I'm not saying it's a bad one. I'm just saying it's not an easy question. Yeah, but it, it, it doesn't mean that you highlight these things. Because I come from .NET, which is a much more modern language. And if you did this in .NET, then it would be like, what, like for example, say, say it's Visual Basic. Why is the package manager in Visual Basic? Right. So the, the remark was like, it's good that you uh, Explain that why is it not uh, using its own language? Like why are you not eating your own dog food when you're writing a package manager? And the reason is, uh, like we said, new languages have a bunch of supports and so people would expect you to use them directly because they already do kind of everything. Which is not yet the case for C++, uh, especially without packages, which is what you're trying to solve right there. So yeah, there is about 300 packages for our content today, and I'm saying curated good packages, like the, the, the kind of thing you can rely on and that should work out for most, if not all, configurations. Uh, it works on ARM, on x86, on most platforms, and when I say most platforms, it's the big three, BSD, uh, Solaris, I don't think anybody's still using that, uh, but it's, it does. Uh, and I don't know if it's, well, basically any platform, or most platform, yes, I mean, there is probably no actually. Uh, there used to be an ARM build of Windows. The question was, uh, is Windows running on ARM? I think it does. Uh, I haven't checked it, to be fair. Right, so how does it work? How do you use Conan? So basically, you write a Conan file as a user. Uh, that's the simplest uh, use case. Like, you, you're a user, you want to try out package management. How do you do it? You write a Conan file, which is just a text file. You have a require section in which you list your, uh, your packages. So in the case of Conan, you list the name of the package, the version you want, and then the channel. As we will see next, Conan is decentralized. You have as many repos as you want, and you just pull stuff from repos. There are two uh, recommended repos, which the first one is Conan itself. It's called just Conan slash uh, stable, which is the, the one that was made by, uh, by, the, by, by the, the, the maintainers of Conan. And the second one is Beancrafter, which is an open source uh, initiative to provide uh, quality packages for Conan. And that's the two ones that are enabled by default and that are uh, available in the default repository. <laughs> and then you tell which generator uh, you want to use. In this case, I use the CMake path, which is the one that is, I think, the most uh, ob obvious for the, for the example I'm going to give yet and that resembles the most uh, the next examples. So then what do you do? You go into your, uh, your you make a build directory, because I think we've all learned by now that you don't put your build inside your source directory, you make another folder. Like let's say you make a subfolder that is your build, and then you just run conan install, which is just gonna have, look at what dependencies you need, fetch them and make them available, and it's gonna generate a small toolchain file that you can just path to CMake, and CMake will then use it to find the packages you need. And you're done. So what is the idea? The idea behind Conan is that it's decentralized. You have you can have as many remotes as you want. There is one by default. You can add as much as you want if you want to test something, if you want to share someone with somebody, if you want to set up your own company repo. That's that's one of the big uh, big things that Conan is about. And that, I think the reason why they work uh, close with JFrog these days uh, is that you can set up your company repos uh, and have entire control about it. You can have per company repo, per team repo. You can have a mix of both. You can tell Conan, Fetch them by priority in this repo, and if you can't find it, fall back on this one. For example, if you want to have a testing repo for your users, that kind of stuff. Uh, since it's owned by JFrog now, uh, you can use it with the default Conan server, which is just a Python executable that is uh, bundled with Conan, or you can use Artifactory, which is uh, an artifact uh, and, uh, and, and, and package uh, host solution that you can deploy in premises, I think. Or you can use Beantray, which is kind of the same thing, but on the cloud. Um, it's not my specialty, but it's like one of these cloud thing. And then uh, everything is a Conan remote that you can set up in the, in the Conan client. It uses binary caching by default. And that's one of the big things uh, if you want to get started with Conan today. 
uh, you just uh, say, okay, I want G-test. And if you're using a combination of, uh, like if, you, if your tool chain is a classic one, there is probably already a binary that is hosted alongside the, uh, the, the artifacts, uh, the, the recipe, sorry, on the, on the server. And then instead of just rebuilding it, Conan will detect, oh, you're basically trying to match that tool chain. I already have something for you. And it's just going to download it. Uh, of course, if you have a company, it's even better because every time you push a recipe, you can just push some pre-built binaries for all the, the build configuration you have, and then you can just share them everywhere and uh, stop wasting time recompiling third parties every time. Uh, of course, it's better to do for closed environment because as we all learned, uh, I think when Harvey talked about ABI and when other people have talked about ABI, it's virtually impossible to host all the possible combination or be 100% certain that a binary hosted somewhere will work as a, as a user library for every environment in the world. Uh, I, I, I've discovered it myself, for example, if you use uh, like an 8 years or 10 years old Ubuntu, which is what my, company, my previous company was using at the time, and you try to pull the uh, G-test by default, well, oh, sorry, uh, it's, gonna, it's gonna try to use uh, something that the JLibc you have does not know, and you're gonna get link errors. Because uh, I talked to, to that with, uh, with the founders and they said, if on the public repo I start differentiating by JLibc version, I'm gonna have to host like a million packages, uh, binary. So it's like, it's as good as it gets if you're using a recent modern classic thing. If you have specific needs, make your own server and, and, and push your own artifacts. You can always tell Conan, I don't trust those binaries, just download and build and build. And store and cache them for me then. Uh, it's not without its defaults, oh, sorry, it's, uh, it's uh, problems or uh, cons. Uh, the default integration method, which is not the one I, I've shown, because uh, uh, it can be a bit intrusive. The, 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 the first one they suggest is just add some common intrusives in your CMake list, which would break rule number three. That's why I'm not using it in my example. Uh, I understand why they're pushing for it. I mean, they have a product to sell, but it also means that then your project will not be able to be used outside Canon unless you do some magic. Uh... Sorry, question? Yeah, this is um, the, the original question. Does it allow vulnerability scanning? Uh, question is Does Canon allow vulnerability scanning? Or more, or more like, like hooks, because I'm guessing it doesn't have that. I, I don't know about it. Uh, I don't know if by default it has CV hooks or what, like pre, 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 pre download hooks. Uh, I guess it's you might need to hook up something on top that just like looks at your uh, at your Conan files like the the, the, the no, like version of dependencies and check them against a, 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 a vulnerability, vulnerability database. Maybe if you go for the enterprise services that they, they offer with JFrog, you have that. But I can't I can't answer that question, yeah, unfortunately. Yeah. Yeah, so the, 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 the remark is about concern about security when you pull packages and you can allow people to pull like random versions of uh, packages of the internet. I think the problem they're trying to solve first is package management by itself, be able to download and work with any third party software, any version. Then if you want to do curation on top of it, uh, not because the package doesn't work, but because there's a vulnerability in the software itself, that's another problem, and there are probably going to be some tooling at some point, but that's not the problem they're trying to solve right there. Um, the other drawback is that the curated uh, package repo is growing slowly. Uh, the focus, obviously, has been on the, on, on, on the, uh, on, on the JFrog partnership products. Uh, so, of course, it means that the investment has been a bit less than uh, the competition on that. And so they have 300 packages today, which is great, but as kind of, it's not as good as the, as the next one I'm going to show, uh, which is VCPKG, obviously. Uh, also, uh, you can host in the same repo different version of the same library, which might be a good or a bad thing. Uh, some people would say that's great because that means you can pull the one you want. Some people would say that's a recipe for disaster because of the diamond problem. You should just forbid that by default. <laughs> Canon has a way to resolve a server con the conflict. And you can specify your own algorithm if you don't trust the default one, which is as long as the major is okay, pick the biggest one for everybody. If you don't like it, you can overload it. But at least it can detect it and warn you and do something about it. 
And finally, uh, multi-target generators is still experimental. What I call multi-target generator is a very Visual Studio workflow thing, which is you open your project and you switch between release and debug. And as we all learn, they have different runtime which are not binary compatible by default, the, MD, the MDD or MTD, uh, MD, the, D, D, the DDD and the, and the D, MTD, oh God. The MT and MD versus MDD and MTD, right? The, the debug runtimes of Visual Studio, basically. Uh, the, the CRTs are different. And by default, Conan doesn't care. Uh, it just installs the binaries you want for one, uh, one target runtime, which is either release or debug, which means you have to have two build folders. Because again, that's a very specific Windows thing. E Linux usually doesn't do that. Uh, Linux, you specify if you want release or debug when you run CMake. There are some experimental support, but it's not the default case. Question? Yeah, is it not target also relevant for embedded building when you have different processor targets and so on? I guess it could. Uh, I don't think it is today, uh, but the, the, the one they have right now is uh, targeting debug and release, uh, specifically debug and release, because there is support in CMake when you find a library to say, oh, by the way, this is the debug version of the runtime, this is the uh, release version of the runtime, and then CMake is able to make the switch in your IDE. I don't think CMake has a support uh, when you find a package to say, oh, this is the x86 one, this is the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the x64 one. It doesn't handle that, so I don't think they will go that far for now. Uh, like in Visual Studio, you can switch between uh, uh, 32 and 64 bits, for example. But I think even with VCPKG, you're going to be out of luck uh, the minute you try to uh, do that with third parties. Question? Well, depending on what you do, you can also, you can also make it possible. Let's say that you want a x64 target runtime without debug as an x64 target runtime. And depending on uh, what platform settings you have in the build new project, you can make it completely impossible to do that binary. Yes, so, yeah, the, the remark was but when you start playing with, uh, the, with the, the, the flipping of the, of the, of the, of the targets, you can, you can easily get into something that will not build uh, at all. Or it will build, but not run. Yeah. That's one. <laughs> right. So, uh, of course, we have an alternative from Microsoft, which is called VCPKG, which started roughly a year after Canon. Uh, from what I know, Microsoft was looking into getting its own uh, package system because one of the big things they, they had in their surveys was that people were, like we said before, like they wanted to try C++ and then they fall into the package management issue and they say like, nope. So basically they tried to revive what Nugget used to do, but in a better way. So it was really done to kickstart development. Like you, you want to start developing and you want to be productive fast and use third parties. Microsoft, can you give me a tool that would just install whatever I need for Windows? And now they extended it, it also worked for uh, OS X and, uh, and Linux. Uh, they've been growing super fast in terms of packages. They have 800s. Most of their focus today is on packaging new stuff, not on actually adding uh, features. When they add features to VCPKG, it's mostly because they, need to, they needed to, to package something new. Uh, as as, as uh, Robert Schumacher, the guy who actually uh, writes on that, his is, is tagline is like, I package the world. Like that, that's my goal. I want to package everything so that anybody can kickstart development with, uh, with packages. Uh, and as far as I checked, they also do the same things, uh, which means they have the three big platforms on ARM and on x86, x and of course the 64-bit variants of uh, x86 too. Uh, how does it work? Well, it's actually kind of similar to Conan, or maybe the other way around, because I kind of cheated with Conan. Uh, so you run VCPKG install. Uh, the difference is, Conan is local, right? Uh, in every project, you write the list of dependencies, and then you run Conan. It says, okay, looking up by that file, I will look up, do I already have the, the binaries built for that, uh, for that uh, target? Yes, we use it. No, build it first, store them, then use them. The VCPKG runs by a global ID. It's like you have a local cache of all the packages you built. Every time you need something, you just run VCPKG install. And then there is one global CMake file you can uh, feed to, uh, to VCPKG, uh, to CMake, sorry. And it will automatically be able to find anything that VCPKG has installed. So it's not as segregated, which may or may not be a good thing, because, for example, it will allow you to pull anything that your local VCPKG has built, even if it's not explicit in your, uh, in your project. Whereas Conan will force you to write inside the project, I need this and that. 
uh, and you cannot just rely on the fact that it's been installed by somebody else. Even if you uh, feed it a common uh, generated file, it will not cook, uh, include anything that is not already in the that you haven't explicitly downloaded for that project, even it, if it has it in a cache. Whereas VCPKG, you will see everything that is uh, already be, uh, that is being built for this particular two chain on this machine, which may or may not be a good thing depending on what you want to do. Uh, it's centralized and version repository. What does it mean? It means that all the recipes that Visual Studio supports are one big Git repo. Uh, it comes with some uh, things. For example, every version at a given time <laughs> is set. Uh, if you if you take a snapshot of the VCPKG repo, all the versions are set and you cannot upgrade one. If you say like, oh, I want to upgrade one package. No, you don't. You just pull at a revision that, is, that contains what you want and you will also get everything else. People will may or may not like it. It has one, uh, one good, uh, very good uh, um, advantage. It offers very high quality curation. Yes, question. So what happens uh, if you have 800 packages yes. and you want to update one, how do they keep everything uh, working at the same time? Right, okay, so I have the answer from Robert himself is I have all the cloud I want from Azure at my disposal, so at every commit I rebuild everything and I make sure that everything works together. Because again, like it's, 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 it's the big uh, gaffe, they can throw, uh, they can throw uh, machines at the problem all day. And that is actually a very good uh, point for Visual Studio itself, which is it will work because every revision has been built for every possible platform. Yes? It's a, it's a, bit, it's a bit how Microsoft does things. I mean, people pay Microsoft a hell of a lot of money to get things to work. And they're not going to be able to do that if they have to do all the things. Yeah, it's, it's, it's kind of the Google approach in that because Google does the exactly the same thing. In, uh, the, 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 the question is like, if you're big enough, you basically throw a lot of money at the problem to, 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 to solve everything else, uh, to, to report errors in five minutes, whatever the, the error is. And that, that, I think that's the approach Google took. I don't know if you saw talk about how Google explains how its build system works internally. It's the exact same thing. They have one huge mono repo, and at every commit, they run everything. And if something fails, you just don't merge. And they don't have problems with, uh, with uh, incompatible versions anywhere, or people that, uh, that, use a, that, that push a new API and then only have the project switching to it and all the others saying, oh, we can't upgrade. You know, the problem is when you have a lot of dependencies uh, in, a, in a lot of projects, you, you're getting stuck by the last one that doesn't want to upgrade to the new version. And that's a problem that just only trickles down. They solve it by saying, you know what? Everybody has to upgrade every time I upgrade something. Done. You cannot just say, I'll see that next month and then never do it and then block everybody else in the company or in the world, which is... Sadly, something that has been seen at large scale. I think Facebook made a, or Twitter, I can't remember, made a talk about it. Look at what the exact same way. Yeah, I mean, it's from the same guys. Yeah. Right. Uh, the question, uh, the remark was that Nougat works the same way, which is true because it's basically made by the same people or they took some IDs. So, yeah, and of course, it's been done for a Visual Studio at first, so it will by default build debug and release for every project you install. And you can do the switch every time. And I guess if you're on Windows all day, that's super great. And if you're like me on Linux, you're like, why am I building twice? Like, I don't care. Just build a release one and give me the debug symbols. That's all I need. Like, I'm not going to debug third parties, usually. Anyway, uh, it also has some issues. Uh, no binary caching at all. Uh, I mean, technically, you can probably sh make a shell folder. Uh, with the Visual Studio, the, the, the VC package cache. But again, they are trying to package and make you something that you can kickstart a development locally. If you want to use it as enterprise level, uh, you're going to have your own cache per machine, but you're going to have to rebuild every time if you pull a new version or whatever. Uh, you're not going to be able to share, you're not going to be able to say, oh, I already, somebody in your company already built it. Well, too bad, you have to rebuild it too. It, there is no support for that. And the argument is that you know, they're afraid that binary compatibility will actually never be solved. So might as well always rebuild from source for your machine. Uh, the Linux support is still a bit behind. Uh, and what I mean by that is that I had to submit a pull request when I was researching for this talk because my first use case didn't work. Uh, okay, I was, I was looking for trouble. I was trying to use Clang with libc++, which was not what the VCPKG expected. Question? How long did it take them to 
Uh, I mean, uh, I mean, uh, uh, basically, uh, when I researched this talk, I was talking both to the. Oh, sorry. The question was, how long did it take uh, for them to respond? Uh, I got response very fast, but I don't think it's been merged yet. Uh, to be fair, since I've been on the package management subject for some time, I usually just ping uh, the guy from VCPKG and the guy from Conan directly on Slack when I need to ask them something. That helped me a lot doing research for this talk. Uh, and so I was like, hey, hey, I'm doing this. Hey, I'm doing that. Oh, I found the bug. So uh, yeah, there is a pull request open. Uh, they have a lot of pull requests open. Uh, again, their focus mainly is packaging everything. So I guess I hope they will accept it at some point. Uh, it's not a complex one. It's not a big problem either. And also, uh, workflow is quite different from uh, users and maintainers. The idea is that basically Conan tries to put you in the shoes of a, pro of a package maintainer, even if you're building your own thing and you don't expect to redistribute it. The default workflow is make me a recipe file that can be used to build your library, which means then your library can be distributed to everybody else. There is a recipe. It could become a package and stuff immediately. VCPKG is more like, I'm doing stuff. I want to use something. Just install stuff. Like, for example, if you have to uh, republish something for VCPKG, like, the bare minimum would be, here is a bad file, run it, it's going to run VCPKG install for you. There is no uh, automatic support for that. And basically, the, uh, the recipe itself is going to be in the VCPKG repo. And most of the time, I think they're done by the VCPKG team. Also, uh, not, to, uh, not to discourage you from submitting, but some people were saying that it's, yeah, Python is not great. And actually, if you look at the VCPKG fact at why not Canon, they take a, a good deal of saying like, yeah, because it's in Python and we all know that we shouldn't be writing Python. All the recipes of VCPKG are written in CMake. <laughs> yeah, I mean, Python is not great, but it's kind of cheap to try to take a shot at someone from using Python when you're all forcing your users to write script in CMake. I mean, don't get me wrong, uh, I've, I've given a talk on CMake. It has, its, it has its merits, but if I had to find a script language, CMake would not have been my choice. Just saying. But yes, of course, the advantage is that everybody has CMake. So you don't need another library or program to run it. Yeah, the, the remark was like, at least it's not written in C++. Well, VCPKG is C++ itself, but the recipes are in CMake. And all the files inside are in CMake. Yes? Does this uh, C page, um, VC page package uh, has any, any support for like local repos and stuff? Uh, it has by default a local repo. A uh, uh, local repo, like uh, you mean uh, recipes? Uh, ah, if you want your own recipes for packages, basically. Yeah, in, in a company. Uh, yeah, it's called git clone and then fork. <laughs> That's literally what they told me. Which means a problem when you have to rebase because you want to update. Because you don't have Azure when you want to update. They do when, you want to, when they want to update everything and check that everything works. It's going to be, I guess, more costly to run all the tests on your uh, company side. I mean, I guess you're going to make AWS rich, but you know what I mean. So. If I have to uh, kind of make a showdown between the two, I would say if you want to try a new out a new third party, VCPKG is probably your best option because out of the box it's quite easy. Just install and then just run CMake, make fine library. You will be able to check it out, see if it works, see if it fits the bill. If you're doing like education or a personal project and you just need a third party to run something, it's great. It's easier to set up. And the, use, the traditional use case of I am using the, 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 the only compiler on my machine is Visual Studio. Everything will auto detect fine. The default settings are fine for you. You don't have to uh, figure out that it's the specific cross compile thing. It's going to be great. If you want to go corporate environments, you have specific tool chains, and, or you want to have your own packages, your own recipes, you don't want to depend on public repos, that kind of stuff. Then Conan has a lot of services behind. Of course, they're not all free because they have to sell Artifactory, Jeff Frog stuff. But they have all the tooling in the world. Yes, question. I mean, to be fair on the last point, if your entire corporation is based on Visual Plus Plus, I think you can be the best you find. Yeah, the remark is uh, if your whole company is running uh, only on Windows uh, and Visual Studio, VCPKG should be fine. Uh, I would say yes and no, because again, uh, if you have to package internal libraries to be used by other ones, it's not as good as Canon, I think, if you want to write your own packages. Oh, but, I mean, I, I've 
packaged mostly for Conan, to be honest. But it's clearly not made for, for it uh, the same way. Uh, like if you run Conan create new package by default, it's going to make like test file that test that your package actually builds, all that stuff. The CPKG is just, it's about using stuff that Hover made. It's not about publishing stuff you made and then reusing it. Sorry, come again? I think someone at Microsoft would then make the comment that why aren't you packing packages that say nougat package when you use an internal company that's nougat? Yeah, so the thing is, like, if really your use case is only Windows, just use nougat because it's basically made for that. Yeah. Right. Uh, so, can I get a quick time check? Anyone has a. How long has it been? 8.45. Hmm? 8.45. Okay, so I'm going to have to skip ahead a bit. I have a question? Yes, go ahead. Before we move on. Uh, so Colin has generators to integrate with other build systems yes. that CMake. Does this package have something similar or are, are you forced to use uh, um, um, Yes, it has one very great for Visual Studio uh, or MS Build and it has one for CMake and after that uh, I think you're out of luck and you're going to have to do it by hand. Submit the pull request? What? Submit the pull request? I guess. But yeah, but the, the, the I mean, basically the way they package everything that is not CMake is basically we write the build in CMake. All right, so how do you make your library easier to package? Because one of the big reasons why these uh, repositories of package have been going so slowly is that every time someone needs to package a library for any other system, he actually has to work. He cannot just put your library here, say this is where the source are, this is the list of dependencies, here is a package. No, that doesn't work. That's, that's the big patch step we talked about when we showed like how is it is like most of the build of the builds of the existing packages have to be uh, patched if you want to package them because they have not been made with package management. A lot of the time the problem is we are not being dumb. We are trying to be <coughs> smart. We are trying to detect that you're doing something or that you're missing something and to work around it. And that's the package management nightmare. Because package management, what does it want? It says run with this. If it fails, fail immediately and tell me why. Don't try to solve the problem for me. Because if you do, it's going to break up along the chain. And I have a bunch of examples uh, to explain that. So yeah, don't try to be creative. Just if we go, for example, for your choice of build system. CMake isn't great. We can all agree on that. But also, all package maintainers know CMake because their package manager is within with CMake or they had to package like a million CMake libraries in their life, they know CMake. If they get a CMake error trying to build your thing, they probably have seen it already. They know how to fix it. They know it's a common hack people do in CMake list. They're going to know how to fix it. If you're using anything else, well, maybe they know because it's kind of well known anyway. Or maybe they haven't never heard of your package manager. So they have to know how it works and what kind of fix is try, tricks is trying to pull by behind your back. And then it becomes super, uh, super, super complicated. Also, everybody has CMake installed if he's trying to do C++. Oh, I mean, most people have it. Everything else means you have a build dependencies you have to install to actually be able to build your package, which is fun or not. Uh, also, expect your users to be on, on, I mean, unless you literally say you don't want to, but most of the time if you're doing C++ and you're trying to be standard and modern, you try to target Windows, Linux, and OS X. So keep that in mind. Uh, don't try to use a specific Windows or Linux intrinsics in the middle of your code and then leave people on Windows guessing how they're going to have to work with it. It's especially true for build. Because I've seen a lot of people saying, yeah, I wrote standard C++ or standard C. And then my build is calling something that is platform specific. Has any one of you tried to package OpenSSL on Windows? It's fun. Oh, you tried. How fun was it? Not at all. Yeah. Right. So for the record, uh, OpenSSL is like 500 years uh, lines of autoconf and bash. Uh, it doesn't build on Windows unless you have MingGW, NSigwin, and possibly your own assembler, uh, which is not the default one. So it's, it's the antithesis of fun. And it's something, I, I guess, it's one of my big fights these days. It's like, stop saying you support Windows because people can just install MingGW. That is not Windows. The Windows workflow is CMake Visual Studio. Anything else 
It's not Windows, it's a hack. Uh, if you have to use it, oh, yes. If you don't want the assembler in OpenSSL, it's optional, you can just disable it. Yeah. So you don't need it. I have a slide about options. Uh -huh. But first, let's talk about assembly. Well, first, don't. If you can avoid it, please, please don't. Uh, because it's fun. All the machines we build for, usually in, the, in those big three, are exactly the same CPU. Yet, the only thing that can actually talk to them is not standard. Windows will use Microsoft Assembler. Uh, Linux will use uh, GAS, uh, the, the bin utils from GCC. And uh, OS 6 actually doesn't even have an assembler by default because Clang doesn't need it. Clang uses IR to, uh, to write binaries. We don't have assembly. That's great, but that's not fun when you have to write assembly and then use them on all platforms. So either you provide two or three different implementations of, uh, of your assembly code, or you use NASM or YASM or whatever ASM, that I, I don't know how many I have seen so far, but that's a build dependency and that's not fun. Uh, in, in general, basically every time you need a code generator, an assembler, or a build system that is not installed, but you cannot assume is installed by default, it means someone is going to have to download and install it, including all its dependencies, and extra fun arises when people start to do cross-platform. Because the generator and all its dependencies have to be built for the host platform, but then everything you build with that is for the target platform. And... Uh, I mean, writing cross-compile-ready uh, cross, uh, uh, build system is a talk by itself. So just know that it's a nightmare every time people have to do with cross-compile uh, and you have to use build tools. So, also, don't hide dependencies, please. Please don't do that. Uh, just write in your readme what dependencies you want. Then, in your CMake file, just say, find package whatever required. Required is great. It will stop compilation if it's not found. Telling the, the maintainer, it could not work because I didn't find package X. It's great. Please, don't try to install dependencies if they're missing. Because you're breaking the diamond rule, I cannot see what is happening. Do not disable features and continue. Because I'm going to make a mistake when I make my, uh, my, pa my recipe for your package. I'm going to forget that you need this dependency. And I'm going to say, with OpenSSL. And you're going to say, oh, I didn't find OpenSSL. Oh, I guess I will build without and then continue. And then someone then gets a bug report saying, hey, why is nothing encrypted? I don't know. <laughs> so please don't do that. If I ask you to build with a feature and you need a dependency and it's not there, just don't continue without it. Just to say, oh, whoop, I can't, I can't. Also, if you can also have no feature or toggle at all, that would be even better. Because again, diamond problem. What if two people require the same library with different figure toggle? How are we supposed to know which one is uh, which one is which? You can try to assume that if you enable everything, that's probably going to be fine, but also possibly not, because sometimes it's like, oh, do you want with Juno TLS or with uh, OpenSSL? I can't answer with both. That's not going to work. Uh, so there is actually a solution for that. Um, this is this is what I usually see, uh, what people usually see, which is I have my lib, and then. If OpenSSL is found, I'm going to make a dependency with OpenSSL and have a bunch of OpenSSL features in my library. And if SQLite is found, I'm going to have some database features. And if none of them are found, I'm not going to build them. Maybe I will put feature toggles, maybe not. Instead, I should go back to my John Lakers book and do this, which I know is more complicated, but also much better for everybody, which is you have a default lib that does what it does. And then everything else that has to have a dependency is built on top of both and is optional. That way I can make the distinction and say, okay, you actually want the SSL component for that library. Sure, I will have it. And then I don't have to resolve feature toggles because there is no feature toggle in that graph. And that is much better. Um, ABI, ABI is fun. Uh, we can make a lot of talks about ABI. Binary compatibility is between things. Uh, there is a lot of tool chains out there and there is a lot of way to break them. So the idea is that when you start building for package management, everything that you build for a specific target has to use compatible ABI flags. If not, some package will not work together. That's, that's as simple as that. So every time you try in your build files to patch, replace, or add C flags or CXX flags, you're taking the risk of breaking ABI. And I've seen that a lot. 
uh, one, one library, for example, loves to do this. I think it was, I can't remember which one. But it's every time it, uh, you start the build, it looks at your flag and says, oh, you're using the, the MD runtime on, uh, on Windows. No, I think you want the MT. And then just does a set on your C flags. Great stuff. So uh, again, no. Uh, if you really can't work with some ABI flags, check and report an error saying, I'm sorry, I cannot build with that toggle on. Don't try to say, hey, you know what, I'm going to remove it because I can't build without. Uh, to have some kind of basic idea of what you can and cannot do, if you had warning flags, debug flags, optimization flags, even the standard flags, uh, for a long time I thought you can't, but you can, you can actually basically build with a novel level of standard. It's the maintainers of your standard library will go at length to make sure that it's still binary compatible. I mean, of course, if you use C++ 17 features in your headers and people ask you to build on C++ 14, uh, that's going to be a problem. But if you just use something in your implementation, you can totally use that even if the toolchain says, ah, we're not ready for C++ 14. You can still use it. It's fine. The compiler, your, your maintainers will make sure it works. Uh, on the other hand, changing arch architecture flags, it's not great. Uh, trying to super optimize, like uh, MCPU, uh, like trying to set MCPU depending on the host, for example. Great stuff, don't do that. Because the target is not always the host. Uh, M32, M64, I don't think anybody ever tried to change that in a build file. But like, if you want a caricature example of what you should not change, don't change bitness flags in your build files. People will not like it. Uh, runtime flags, of course, don't replace my runtime behind my back. Uh, Libstat C++ versus, versus Lib C++, uh, MT, MD, that kind of thing. That, that doesn't work. And uh, ASIN, usually, um, in some cases it works, but in a lot it doesn't. Uh, everything has to be built with ASIN, else you will get link errors. Uh, especially, I think, if you have uh, um, like C++ types or all that stuff. Some defines also break ABI. Uh, there are basically two that everybody probably has seen in, in his life, maybe once, maybe just only on the weird Stack Overflow report because it doesn't compile. Uh, the first one switched the way the iterator debug works on Windows. It generates two different sets of, uh, of iterators. They are not compatible at all. They don't have the same size. They don't have the same member layout. It doesn't work if two projects use different values. Same thing with uh, libc++, uh, uh, libc++, they switched to the c++11 uh, implementation in GCC5, I think. Uh, for example, start string at some copy and write issues in the past. They are not compatible, don't try to flip that. Basically, what I would like to be able to, if I want to package your library, is say, cmake minus the toolchain file that will tell you all the architecture I need, make, make install, Done. It works. If I need to do anything else, you're taking risks. Right. So what's next? Are we there yet? Well, I mean, we're better than what we used to be. Uh, I mean, we have VCPKG, we have Conan. We didn't have that three years ago. Uh, we're getting somewhere. It's slow because, again, C++ is not new. The build is not part of the standard. It will probably never be. Uh, and we have to harmonize 30 years of divergent practices when it comes to build. And some habits die hard. And I don't see OpenSSL switching to CMake anytime soon, which is very sad. Uh, or any other project, for that matter, that is big enough to say, like, eh, ah, too, too expensive. So... I mean, convergence is easy, right? We write a new standard and then everybody... No, I, I'm joking. Uh, yeah, we can't rewrite the build of all existing libraries. We can locally try to, but most people will actually reject a pull request that says, hey, I written, I rewritten all your build in CMake. Uh, most maintainers will say, nope. Uh, but what we can do is package them and expose them in a standard way, which is we basically wrap your things into something that can actually download build and install them on every platform that is at least part of the big three with reasonable standard things. Uh, of course, we should help new projects to a higher standard. Like, I understand and it's understandable that older projects will need some patches to be applied on, uh, on the build files to be able to, to, to work with that because they have 20 years of acts to work. But new projects should be held to the higher standards, like CMake 3.6 or, or whatever didn't, didn't exist like five years ago. So, of course, 
you couldn't do everything you could do today. But now it's now it's there. So I didn't have a slide about it, but please stop stop saying like require CMAX 2.8 because no, we have CMAX 3.12 now or 13. There's a bunch of new features that will help you write very simple CMAX list. Please use them for your new project. It's not the best. You, ha you can have a lot of reasons to say, well, yeah, but CMAX sucks because X or Y or Z, or it's not, it's, it's not declarative, for example. It's mostly script. Uh, it's, it's an horrible syntax with functions and globals and everything is actually a string, even if it looks like a list. I, I, can, I can talk about this forever. But also, if you try anything else, you'd be the one person that everybody hates to package because it needs to understand, install, and work with this new crazy build system. Uh, and, and believe me, I've worked with different companies and a couple of them have tried to say, you know what, CMake is garbage, we'll rewrite our own build system, that's great. And usually the first 90% are trivial. And then you start getting into the fun stuff and you discover why CMake has taken so long to have all those very fun edge uh, cases to, to run. Uh, and they're not fun to handle. So stick to whatever we have and remember, if you stick to a very simple find package, find package, add library, this is my sources, done. I mean, I can write a script in basically any language that can just pass this and just turn it into any other declarative uh, super new build system of the future that we don't have yet. It's going to be easy to, to, to port to, to, to whatever is fixed. You're not going to be married with CMake, but at least you're going to be easy to package. So yeah, write a simple CMake list. Run the checks. Check everything you need. If something miss, fail, tell us why. Don't try to fix it yourself. Rely on the tool chain. That's, that's something I think I, I should make a, note, uh, a, a full talk about this. Yeah, question. The one, that, that one, the second one. Yes. I mean, that's pretty standard on most package managers. Why? why? Build files. I'm not, uh, I mean, uh, I've seen a lot of projects which literally try to fix problems when they see them. Why? What is, what is the logic behind uh, that? Uh, because without a package manager to handle that for you, uh, you prefer your use. I mean, VCPK even doesn't follow that own rule for. Uh, that's the reason I had to submit a, a, a fix for VCPK. People want things to just work. So every time they get a bug report, they just say, ah, I'm going to put a hack that handles that case. And then people are going to be fine and satisfied because if they install just my library, it's going to work fine. But the minute you try to integrate that in a, uh, in a larger environment and package managers, then everything falls apart. So it's always a, a trade-off. It's if your library is the only thing I use, yes, you can hack away most of the common bugs uh, or issues that people will run into instead of trying to tell them, no, just make a tool chain fine and everything will be fine. That's very common. And I think that's, that brings the next point, which is, Toolchain file is something we should do by default. We should always have a toolchain file that says, this is my compiler, this is my, uh, my build flags, and this is the only place they can be defined or changed. And everybody in this whole uh, space should use it. And anything you build that doesn't use that is another environment and they should never cross. That's how you should do it. That's not what we do today. Uh, and I have an next slide for that. And of course, if you have requirements, please tell me in the readme. Tell, tell the package managers in the readme that uh, you need to install this and that. It's not fun trying to be detective and find what dependencies we actually need to configure something. Uh, what are the challenges for the future? I would say more standard would be nice. Uh, I'm not saying like standard as a C++ standard, but at least de facto standard on how people use things and do things. Like I, I would love, for example, uh, to have, I think I have a slide after that, I'm getting ahead of myself. But yeah, uh, like for example, there is no way to describe your requirements. There is the canon file, for example. VCPKG would just say, you know what, just run VCPKG install, and then CMake has his own find package thing. It would be nice if we could centralize everything in one thing that a package manager can query to know what to install, and the build manager can query to see if everything is actually available. That would be that would that would help a bit. Also, a uh, mani uh, package manifest upon install, so that once you build something with a f with a package manager, it can actually be reused by another one because there is a standard way of describing what has been installed and how to consume it. I mean, we have technically package config, but it falls apart pretty quick in some cases. It works fine if you're doing C on Linux, not so great every, every uh, as soon as you get out of it. Uh, 
we need to lower the cost of entry in package management in general. Uh, tool shelf files, as I say, I think are very important and clearly underused today. And one of the big reasons is that you start C++, or even you're an experienced C++ developer, you start something and, oh, I need to set up a toolchain file. Like most people I ask, I have no clue even how to set one on CMake. And most of the time, the defaults are actually sane. It's just like, okay, tell me which compiler you want. Tell me, tell me which architecture you target. Maybe if you want some specific optimization flag on top of the standard ones. And that's about it. And that's a toolchain file that is perfectly sane. Uh, but most of the time you don't. Uh, and so it, 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 it makes problem where some people say, oh, I'm just gonna, like some build will say, oh, I'm going to use the default on the platform. Some people are going to say, oh, I'm going to use the one that you pass as argument. Some of us say, oh, I'm going to check an environment variable to sue like the dollar CC or whatever. And then, it, and, and, and then it's inconsistent everywhere. And if we just could say like, you know what, this is a description of a tool chain and just everybody please use that. CMake as a standard thing. And most package manager using CMake, I would say that should be your, your de facto standard. And so I think, like for example, when Microsoft installed uh, installed uh, MSVC on your computer, it could just generate one and say, okay, you know what? This is your uh, vc.cmake default one. Just use that. It's going to be fine. You can tweak it afterwards if you want a new profile for another kind of build. Or maybe provide a wizard. Um, I think Isabella Muerte made a, made a very good point about that two years ago when she made a talk. It's like... A new people, uh, like you start to, um, if you start a new language in the world, right? Like Python, whatever. You install the language, you open a tutorial, and you run whatever compiler or interpreter is there, and it runs. C++, okay, which compiler do you want? Are you going to use GCC or Clang? Wait, which version of the standard do you want? C++ 17, 14, 11? Wait, which, uh, which standard do you want? Do you want, uh, do you want libc++ or do you want libc++? Wait, do you want the all or the new ABI on libc.c++ exactly? Uh, and, 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 and most people are like, what is this? I just wanted to learn how to program. Like, something easier, something more simple. Get support for the, from the build system. I would love to have a strict mode on CMake that, for example, puts most of the flags as read-only Every time someone, someone tries to do a set on a C flag, it says, nope, not allowed to do that. Sorry, buddy. Uh, just say, nope, most of the features are not available. Just if you don't use this basic subset of commands, just, just get out. Just there is a problem with what you're doing. Like there is too many options and too many, too many scripting options to hack away the first problem you get instead of just going for the standard option. Of course, report everything in the build file that basically would make package management complicated. Especially people trying to say, hey, I'm going to download some files and then compile something. Right, so how can you help? Or what can you do? Well, first of all, you can try out a package manager tomorrow. Uh, or maybe tonight if you're very, very eager. Just download one. Try it. Tell me what you think. Tell the guys who made it what you think. Tell them about your use case. Tell them about your crazy uh, toolchain that they don't have and is not working. Every time I tried, I found a bug and I had to report something. But now it's fixed and it worked. Uh, make your library packageable if you actually have an open source library that uh, you are uh, pushing on the web somewhere. Uh, submit a recipe for it to Canon or VCPKG, possibly to both. Tell your friends that package management is a thing and then they can come back to C++ now. Maybe. Soon. Uh... So yeah, to, uh, to, 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 to close up, uh, package manager are already out there. There are at least two that are very solid and that show a lot of promises and all in their own way can handle a lot of stuff. VCPKG is great if you want to try out new package and do your own development or, or if you're into education, training, that kind of stuff. Canon is great if you, have your own, uh, if you have a company thing and you want your own servers and you want to play with your own repo, do distributions, all that stuff. <coughs> Maybe you actually have cl clients or, or to which you want to provide your library with your own distribution mechanism and repos. You can do that with Canon. All for that. Document uh, white packageable libraries. Remember that if you write a library, it doesn't have to be the most perfect build in the world. You don't even have to write a package recipe. Just make sure that it's easy to package by following the steps. Document your requirement. Tell me in the README, I need this and that and this and that to build. And look up that toolchain file, tool file thing. It, it's going to help you a lot. And with that, thank you.
also uh, a bunch of resources I resourced recently. Uh, I researched and or, or read recently to, um, to to for this talk. There are too many to tell, but three standouts. Uh, the first one is the one that inspired my section three, which is a talk from uh, the, the, the creator and maintainer of ECPKG, Robert Schumacher, which is don't package your libraries, white packageable libraries. It's 30 minutes of good suggestion on how to make package, uh, pa uh, package libraries and all that stuff. If you want to have the same topic, but uh, on a more lightweight or a funny or ranting way, there is how to make package manager cry from uh, Keith Host uh, at Forsdam. Uh, he basically uh, retells his adventures of how he had to package some uh, unfortunate libraries. And he gives great tips on how to make the life from people horrible. And I think his best example, if you have ever tried, is uh, that, what is this? I, ca I can't remember the name. Um, that thing, in, uh, that Google, uh, oh, whatever, uh, a Google library that is horrible to package on Windows. <sighs> whatever. Uh, but yeah, great, great stuff if you want to know how not to package a library. And if you want to have fun but you only have five minutes, uh, the creator of Conan has made three lightning talks, five minutes each of why you should not use Conan. So in other words, we should get a second book for IT managers because our life is so easy. What? We should get a second book for IT managers so, so because our life is so easy. Yeah, maybe. You can try. If you understood the joke. I'm not sure, actually. <laughs> Go, come on. You give the second book to the manager of how not to do things, and they will order you not to do exactly that. Yeah. Yeah, the remark is like, show the second one to your, uh, to your, to your, to your boss so that it doesn't actually, uh, like, take it as a, like, doesn't order you to do that. Yeah. Yeah. But you, yeah. Right. Anyway, uh, I'm not sure how much I am on time, but I am, like, roughly an hour and something. I have an hour and a half, I think, at the CCU, so I should be fine. It's a bit longer than I thought. But now is the moment when you have to tell me what I, what I need to cut to actually fit or ask any question you want. Um, okay. How do I know if my package or if my library is packageable? Is it just by the toolchain file? Uh, well, basically, you open your CMake list and you look at how many worker. Uh, first of all, are you using CMake? Well, uh, it's just a hypothetical. Okay, hypothetically, are you using CMake? Do you have any if or, or uh, function or loops in your uh, CMake list? It's usually a bad sign. Like every time you, you start doing scripts, mm -hmm. it means you're doing something specific for somewhere. There might be good reasons for that. There is also a lot of bad reasons. If you try to reset or override flags, or if you try to download and build stuff, <coughs> If you try to check if something is available and do something and continue if it's not there. Okay. So it's the things that you mentioned. If yes. I don't do any of those, yeah, I you're probably in a good place. Uh, the question was uh, how can I tell if my library is actually packageable? Arvid. So you, uh, I think Colin, but also this pack, you mentioned that they support ARM and x86. Yes. Uh, why do they? Support certain architecture. Why don't they? If you build everything from the source, why don't they support it? That's a good question, actually. Um, I, I guess because, hypothetically, they could work with more, but they have to. Well, first of all, they have to restrict to whatever the testing, because when you publish a package, you have to guarantee it works. And I guess they went for the two bigs, which is all the embedded processors to this or ARM and all the desktops and servers or x86. I mean, Spark is still existing, but barely. Uh, I don't know if there are many more today. Yes. You think that GNU, GNU manager, uh, <coughs> package manager will ever support this, or are they doing it already? The what? The GNU people. Yes. Will they support this? The question is, will the GNU people support this? I don't know. They contributed uh, AutoConf and AutoMake to humanity, and it was super great at the time, and it's ugly now that I have to package anything on Windows. Uh, I really wish they would realize that AutoConf and AutoMake should die and be replaced by CMake. But I'm not sure it's going to happen seeing whole... I mean, first of all, CMake is doing in C++, so that's already a problem because, I mean, sadly, to be fair, a lot of people... I mean, maybe not a lot, but there's still a, a resistance to C++ in general in the, in the Unix world. They try to keep that away from everything. They try to keep it away from GCC for years. Uh, it's getting better, but we're not there yet. So, yeah, I don't know. I, I hope they would move to CMake, but I don't think any GNU project these days uh, will be like, you know, thank it and, uh, and leave it, like uh, Marie Kondo said or something. All right, question. It looks that the GNU people will not go to CMake. What I see for System P 
they go to Mason. Uh, Manson. Uh, yeah, uh, they will try Mason. Well, uh, I heard people saying me that Mason was great. Uh, I, to be fair, I didn't try it much. Uh, if it solves everything, C makes solves maybe. But again, most of my libraries are going to be written in C make today. So, ah. It's not impossible if Mason is big that we will have bindings to easily package stuff with, written with Mason. Uh, but as far as I know, it has a ridiculously slow, uh, small market share compared to CMake. Question over there. Have you used vector uh, rules, package manager, manager, or look at it? <sighs> it's a tool for basically making these kinds of packages from your project. Here. Who is the, the person who made it? What is his actual name or her actual name? No, okay, because no, the no. name rings a bell. I might have actually. He has written the CMake extension for Visual Studio Code, and he's posting in the Slack channel as Vector of Bool. And he made a blog. He's the guy who made the blog about modules that they will break the build or that will not work nicely with build systems. I think I read something about it, but I can't remember it. They're a very active member of the C++ community on wow. Slack. I, I probably know them, but uh, don't know their handle or whatever. I will have to double check. Yes, Sebastian? Uh, coming back to the beginning, um, do you think that uh, the honest Stostrup uh, is satisfied with the current state of affairs? No, he doesn't have... Mo oh, okay. Right, so the question is, do you think the honest is, uh, is, uh, is satisfied? No, and for two reasons. One, Bjarne will never be satisfied, and <laughs> because the day is satisfied, uh, we can stop doing C++. And I think it's a good thing he continued to challenge us today. Uh, 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 and also, we don't have modules. But uh, I think we're getting better. Uh, I think one of the big things he mentioned is education. And that's actually a, a, something that has been echoed in a few conferences last year, which is like less and less people taking C++ classes because C++ looks old. And that language, when you can't do anything out of the box with it. Uh, and that's a problem for future generations because, I mean, we know it from video games. There is not a lot of alternative to do video games today uh, besides C++. And I mean, I think John can tell you about the fun of finding new C++ programmers every day. And I think we all know about this. So yeah, the, the more it, uh, the, the easiest it's become to do sexy thing with uh, your student project, I think the best it is for the community in general. But we're not there yet. But we are progressing. But then again, uh, I guess it will also mean that teachers have to know about this, but then again, they should also stop teaching me C++ uh, 98. So, yeah, we'll get there. Question? Yes. Are you using um, a package manager for your internal dependencies within Paradox? Uh, are we using package manager at uh, Paradox? No, not yet. I can't answer that question without my lawyer. Uh, no, we're not. Not right now. Uh, we have as many people our own package manager system. Uh, I will not delve into detail, but basically, no, not yet. Uh, but we might look into it. Uh, uh, Which um. one would you choose? Me, personally? Yeah. That's a tough question. Um, my biggest problem is that I will have to face the other maintainer at the conference sometime next year. So um, <laughs> I will have to actually. Uh, I mean, historically, I would have gone with Conan, uh, because I think it's very good for enterprise cases. Uh, I think basically the question is, will I have to write my own packages? If I have to, I will probably go with Canon. Uh, may possibly patching a few things I don't like uh, or one would like to see another way. Uh, but I think VCPKG, because I'm not exactly sure I can still trust VCPKG uh, entirely on, uh, on, on, on OS X, but it's, it's getting there. Question? Yeah, there's another dimension. Apart from the practicality of having everything packaged for you and getting it to work, uh, potentially you could get better performance if you can build everything from source and have the whole program optimization. Can yeah. you comment on that? So the question is, uh, can you get better performance if you build everything from source? Uh, I mean, yes and no, that depends on your targets. Uh, what I'm saying is that are you building stuff that you run on your own servers or are you distributing something to a client? Because, for example, in the video game industry, uh, we have to set minimum configuration requirements. And if you want an example, we don't enable AVX today because mm, not all our clients have AVX. Uh, so we'll, we cannot uh, tell Clang, like, be as aggressive as you think. <coughs> P 
thinking people have the latest Xeon because that's obviously not the case and that might generate code that just doesn't run. But in theory, uh, yes, it's going to be better than having binaries in your Git repos that have been built by a 10 years old compiler uh, and that nobody knows how to rebuild and also probably don't even enable ECC. Yes, that's going to be faster for that. Sure. Uh, there is uh, an, inherent, an inherent risk with not having package management in your company, which is you're going to have binary blobs somewhere because they solve an issue because it's a nightmare to rebuild from source every time without a package manager. We've all been there. The problem is, and I, I, I faced it multiple times in multiple companies, someday you say, you know what, I'm going to upgrade my compiler. And then you're like, wait, how did we build that thing? Do we even kept the sources? Did someone actually had to patch the sources? Did he contribute back the patch or I should be even archive that? Did he actually think about building it with release or did he just really build it on his machine and did not notice it was in debug? Like in, in, a, in a previous company we had a, for example in our common repository we have a CMake binary so that people didn't have to, opti to optimize them, uh, install them themselves. It was built in debug and people complained that it took 10 minutes to configure the project. That was fun. Yes, question. Uh, the question is how do you do reportable builds with a VCP cache that doesn't all versions? It, does, uh, it doesn't end all versions in the sense that you cannot have a uh, different version of the same package. You have a snapshot of with, which basically fixes the versions of everything at a given point in time. And so it's repeatable in that sense. Yes, RL. As far as I understood you, uh, for VC package, there is not even a plan to split the recipes from the tool VC package and give the user control about versions of... Uh, the, the question is, is there a way to split the recipes from VC package? Today, no. Uh, one of the reasons is that the maintainer will keep its, uh, wants to keep the option to actually upgrade VC package just to support a new recipe. So to not have the rendezvous problem, it just says everything is in the same repo. You want new recipe, you will also rebuild the tool that builds the recipes. So it solves a bunch of problems. It opens other alleys. I would say if you can afford to have the mono repo thing, so far it's been proven to be the most reliable. Uh, but it comes with constraints that you may or may not be able to accept. Yes? The problem is I don't have control over what the versions I use. Uh, tomorrow I will have total new versions of the recipes. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I agree. It's, it's not like doable in some. Yeah, so the discussion is that the fact that you don't really have uh, control of the version, then you can't uh, fix a, a particular version. And if you want to upgrade the tool or other packages, you have to take all the upgrades with it. And I think it's following kind of the, uh, I don't know if you've seen the keynote last two years ago from uh, Titus Winters, Live at Head, which is basically come with me, um, like, th this is the only way to go, it's the only way forward. Uh, I'm not gonna let people choose when they upgrade, because experience has proven that if you let people choose when they upgrade, the, US, the answer is never, until someone really needs it, and then some other people have no time to do it, and then everybody's stuck. And I've seen it, and a lot of people have seen it. And at small scale, it's manageable. Uh, when you start growing to a company, not even like Google, like if you even have like two, like a bunch of projects in your company, everybody has to use the same version of a library and the new version uh, requires some change in your code to actually work. If one team in the company says, nope, we don't have the budget to switch to the new one, well, nobody upgrades. And that's not fun. And Amazon, I think, the, or I think it was Amazon, realized that uh, but, uh, you, you can publish as many new versions if you want of your 19 old libraries. But people will still make bug reports about the version that you released five years ago because they haven't upgraded. And when you say, can you upgrade? They say, nope, please support the old one. And backporting isn't fun. Sometimes you have restricted environments where you have rules from the outside world to dictate some stuff. So yeah, uh, the outside world, world, yeah, the, the, the remark is that the outside world might dictate something from you. Well, I guess it's, uh, yeah, you have to be aggressive. I mean, it's, it, it's, Techn it, technically, it's costing co your company money to support all their thing and not push people to upgrade. So sometimes it's, uh, like, to give you an example, uh, it's, it's a dumb example, but it's, I worked in banking software. That was my first job. I, we were doing online banking. 
and we want, really wanted to get rid of the mini of the. Oh, uh, there was, uh, is anyone French here? Or I've known about France. We did not invest in uh, internet in '96 because we thought we had something better, which is called the Minitel, which is some kind of terminal you can use. Uh, it's basically an integrated modem. It's great. It's uh, VT100 uh, text. It's awesome. Uh, except that slowed everybody's uh, adoption of the internet, and so we had to support that stuff in 2008. <laughs> yes. And so it was costing the company a lot of money because we had to keep a full team of two developers and a bunch of QAs just because every time the bank made a new service, it had to add Minitel support for a bunch of like maybe 100 clients. But they were old clients. And so they had, on average, much more money than young clients because they had the life to actually make money. So the bank didn't want to part with them until a new manager came in and said, you know what? I'm going to take all the ones that actually have a good amount of money in the company. I'm going to buy them a Mac. I'm going to buy them a teacher to tell them how to use a thing. And next year, the system is down. It costs less than actually maintaining it for two more years. So, yeah, you know. Go ahead. About upgrading and keeping the latest. I mean, the security on the internet today. So, I mean, just keeping with old versions everywhere. It's not a good thing in the long run, though. Yeah, I think. The agreement is that it's hard, it's in the long run it's going to cost you to have to maintain older version and older version and all that stuff. Yes, question. But I mean, it is an interesting discussion because I, I think when Microsoft made the tool, they wanted to aggressively push everyone to the latest version also on Azure. But you make a valid point that sometimes it is just not possible. For example, the one thing that I can think about is medical software, where you actually have to validate against some legal process. I mean, you just can't because that would mean validating everything again. Yes, the idea Max that some industries are actually very, they have a long release cycle, long test cycles, and uh, if you change one dependency, you have to revalidate everything. So I guess you're going to upgrade in hopes, but then you're going to upgrade everything. At least, I mean, you're still going to do upgrades. Maybe not every time, but if you have to do a new validation, you won't do it for one library. You will do for everything new there at once. Maybe it's acceptable. I mean... Another question? That was a lot, actually, but it's cool. Thank you.